allergies in your dogs in that regard, because that is genetic. Pyometra in females, 5.3%. Um, arthritis at 3.1%. So that's an interesting number there. It w would be more interesting to know the breakdown of age for, um, for arthritis, and that's something we probably could look into. Um, at OFA to, to analyze it because we, we do have the raw data on these health surveys to figure that out for you. Not that it's a hugely important thing to do, um, but that is something that's higher on your list. And, and so it tells us we do have musculoskeletal disease of some kind going on in your breed. Irregular heats. You know, the fact that that three of the top five diseases in this health survey are female reproductive diseases is kind of interesting to me. Um, and the thing is, most people, if this was advertised through, okay, looking at results that, that I didn't put on here, it asks whether you're a club member or not, whether you're a breeder or not, and two-thirds of the people that filled out that survey, two-thirds of the 814 are breed, are, uh, Afghan Hound Club of America members, and one-third are not members. So, so it does tell you that two-thirds of the people are, are members and probably breeders um, and keeping their bitches intact. But that's a lot of female reproductive issues. So, are there a lot of female reproductive issues in your breed? It's just kind of, all I'm doing is reporting the numbers, and whether these numbers are spurious or whether they're accurate, I don't know, but, but it is what's, what's out there on the survey right now. Hemangiosarcoma as, as, and lymphosarcoma both come in 2.7, 2.5% as your more frequent um, genetic disorders, um, genetic cancers that you see in your breed. And you've listed cancer as being a, an issue for your breed. And I know that hemangiosarcoma is something that we do see in, in Afghan hounds um, and then lymphosarcoma. Um, failure to conceive is failure to conceive can be due to any number of things. So that's not necessarily genetic. It just means that you've got, you know, you've got bitches being bred and then they don't have, they don't have litters. And if you have failure to conceive, you need an investigation. You need a, a third genologist working with you and figuring out, you know, are they pregnant at 20 days by ultrasound and, and do those disappear? You know, or did they not get pregnant? Or, or you know, did you miss, you know, did you miss, uh, you know, um, insemination or breeding at the proper time because it's a timing issue many many times so and, and there's lots of other there's environmental you know um, endocrine disruptors that are out there now that you know just about everything chemical that we use is an endocrine disruptor now and that certainly affects uh, conception as well food allergy at 1.8 percent so I'll tell you that most people will, and most of my clients as well, will tell you since my dog has allergies, it's most likely a food allergy. And I'll tell you that food allergy is one of the least frequent allergies that we see um, when we're dealing with allergies. So, um, so it's not the first one to think of. So people might think they have food allergies, um, which is a specific allergic reaction to a specific protein, okay, chicken or, or whatever else. Um, and, uh, and, and, and not that we don't have lots of really good foods now that help dogs with allergies, but it's not because that have omega fatty acids and all sorts of things to try to make them less allergic, but it's not because they don't have what they're allergic to, and it's most likely that they have inhalant allergies because that's the most frequent allergies that we see. One other thing, just as an aside, um, you know, grain-free, um, was, has been the big fad for a long, long time now. And as veterinarians, we kind of say, well, you know, there's no science behind grain-free, but there's nothing wrong with it. But now we know what's wrong with grain-free. Okay, the FDA came out last November, so almost a year ago now, uh, that grain-free causes heart failure, causes dilated cardiomyopathy. And it's not just one type of grain-free or one brand of grain-free. The bottom line is, the theory behind grain-free is that dogs are carnivores. So they shouldn't be eating grain, they should be eating um, meat. But the thing is, what carnivores eat are herbivores, and their bellies are filled with carbohydrates and with grains, okay? And grains are an essential part of a carnivore's diet, and without it, they go into heart failure. So we now know that you need to get off grain-free, or you need to supplement with grains, and they're not allergic to those grains, okay? And, uh, and so that's something your veterinarians should be telling you because it's a very, very important thing. I'm treating dogs in heart failure from grain-free diets, and just about every veterinarian is at this point. Um, okay, hip dysplasia, 1.8%, congestive heart disease, 
at 1.8. So congestive heart disease is, is end stage. So it's not telling us if you have mitral valve disease, if you have, have um, a, a cardiomyopathy, if you've got uh, a, 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 a conduction disturbance, a, a heart block. Um, it's just congestive heart disease, but, it, but there you are on, on the first column. Inflammatory bowel disease, 1.7. So that can cause vomiting or diarrhea, but chronically throughout the dog's life, it's not something they get better from. Seasonal allergies, 1.6. And if it's seasonal, it's probably inhalant because that's what you get with your different seasons. You get your trees, in, depending on what part of the country you're in. Some, country, some parts don't have seasons. I don't understand that, but at any rate. Uh, you know, trees in the spring, grasses in the summer, weeds in the fall, and dust mites and molds in the winter. You know, that, that's your seasons, and if you've got dogs that are allergic to all four of those, they'll be allergic year-round. And if you have dogs that are allergic to just some of those, then they will be worse during those seasons. Atopic dermatitis is inhalant allergies. That is the most common allergies that we see in dogs. Heart murmur, so again, telling us that you've got some heart disease there. And then behind it, it says cardiomyopathy. So, and that's a specific diagnosis. So that means that your dogs are being diagnosed with a, a cardiomyopathy, most likely a dilated cardiomyopathy. Am I right there? That anyone that's had a diagnosis, ever heard of a dog with cardiomyopathy? Is it, have they been told it was dilated? Or, you know, because we don't really get hypertrophic or restricted in, uh, in dogs as much. We see dilated. In cats, we see the other types. Um, and mostly it's the larger uh, uh, statured dogs, so it's big hearts that can, are more prone to developing cardiomyopathy. Colitis, which is inflammation of the intestine that could be part of inflammatory bowel disease. It's, it's more of a symptom than a specific diagnosis. Osteosarcoma as your next of the four malignancies, and mast cell tumor is as the fourth of the four malignancies are lower on the list. Then you've got liver disease, hypothyroidism, and retained testicles. Um, and, uh, and so those are the diseases that were at 1% or above in the, on your breed health survey. Okay. Um, the, so chylothorax is a disease that you see in your breed, and we'll talk about it, but it's, it isn't reported out of that 814 dogs there, or not enough to reach 1% in that regard. So, so it is going to be an infrequent disorder, but a very serious one when it does occur. Um, if the numbers are correct, and, and again, we, we don't have those numbers to know exactly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, some of the disorders, and let's also look at the databases that are available. So the OFA I registration registry um, is what replaced SURF um, as the I registration for the um, the College of Veterinary Ophthalmology, the ophthalmologists um, requested from SURF that they, um, that they collect a lot more data so to enable them to figure out what's going on with eye diseases, and SURF did not want to or have the capacity to do that, and so they went, they asked OFA, they said, we don't want to know just about cataracts, we need to know age of onset, we need to know progression, we need to know all of these other data, and, um, and this OFA is now supplying them with that data as well, uh, and as well as um, the OFA is giving all that money back to the, um, to the ophthalmologist foundation for research. So we, we donate from the, uh, since we're not for profit, the money generated by those eye examinations are donated right back to the ophthalmologist uh, foundation for research, and that is funding research into eye diseases. So, um, there are 349 Afghan hounds that were examined between, tw uh, no, 349 Afghan hound examinations between 2015 to 2019. That can include dogs that were examined multiple times. All right. The other thing that the ophthalmologists wanted is that SURF was recording only eye exams during eye clinics. The ophthalmologists wanted every single eye that, that was ever examined by an ophthalmologist to go into the database because the sick animals are coming to their office for regular appointments to get worked up. And those dogs were never, were never captured by SURF because SURF was only doing eye clinics. So now every single exam that an ophthalmologist does has a form filled out and is sent into the OFA. Whether you register, whether the owner registers it or not, you know, for breeding purposes, doesn't make any difference. These dogs are all being recorded, so now we're getting accurate results on what's going on within the breeds. 
So 81.3% of the Afghan hound examinations were declared normal. 13% had what's called cataract significant or a significant cataract. That's 45 dogs. 12.6% um, had corneal dystrophy, and I'll talk, show you what that is in a second. And 7.4% had cataract significance unknown. This is one point that I, I have problems with the ophthalmologists, is that they are checking off cataract significant versus cataract significance unknown, and it can be the exact same cataract. They have no definition as to what, which one is significant or not significant, and a lot of times it depends on whether that ophthalmologist wants to be nice to the person or not, and wants to have them come back for more examinations. But the bottom line is, uh, any cataract is significant. That should not be you know, what's written down there. It should, should just say cataract, posterior suture, posterior por, you know, polar cortex. It should put the location of the cataract because that's very much inherited and breed specific and leave it at that. Um, the ophthalmologists do say that no dogs with, cataract, with a cataract, whether it was checked off as significant or not, should be, should be bred. And that's a kind of an absolute, and I'm not really big on absolutes, but definitely if a dog has a cataract, um, if it's going to be considered for breeding, it better have a whole lot of other really high quality stuff in order to override the fact that it's got a cataract. Uh, but some cataracts don't, you know, don't impair, don't progress and don't impair vision, so it's a lot less um, severe than a dog who loses its vision due to cataracts. Um, posterior sutures is your number one specific location of the cataract. So that's the, the back of the lens, and there are sutures, which are, are the lines of the, where the, when the lens formed, and that's where that cataract forms. And so that's your most frequent individual cataract in your breed. Uh, persistent pupillary membranes, iris to iris, is a persistence of a fetal membrane that's supposed to break down um, as the eyes develop. And, uh, you know, I don't say break down at birth because you guys know the eyes aren't open at birth. Those eyes are still developing for several weeks before the eyes eventually open. Um, but they should break down and disappear. And sometimes you get strands between the iris and the iris. And those are not significant and they do not affect vision except in Basendries, which is a whole different, different aspect because that's a disease process in, in that breed. Other persistent pupillary membranes, iris to lens, iris to cornea, um, uh, sheets of fetal membrane, those, those are bad, those should not be um, bred, but that's not something that you're seeing with any significance in your breed. Okay, cataracts in your breed, the way it's reported by the ophthalmologist, they're, um, what they see most frequently is a rapidly progressive juvenile cataract in your breed. It begins as what are called equatorial vacuoles, which is occurring um, at the equator or, or the, the, the ridge of the, of the lens between four months to two years of age and extend forward and backward in the lens. Um, and there's an undetermined mode of inheritance and the ophthalmologists do not recommend breeding any Afghan hound um, that has any kind of cataract, but this is the one they say they see most frequently in your breed. So it develops in a younger dog and, uh, and it can progress. Some of them do not progress. Okay, corneal dystrophy is a clouding on the surface of the cornea or the surface of the eyeball. And it is a lipid accumulation. And this is an inherited um, disorder. It does not usually progress to visual impairment, but sometimes it can get large enough. Um, when it's small like that, it's actually not what's in the visual plane. So when you think about like a camera lens when you're focusing it, um, so that lipid accumulation is not in the focus area, so you're actually looking through it. So it can cause a little bit of blurriness, but it doesn't actually affect your vision um, in that way. No treatment is necessary. It doesn't cause any other kind of disease, like glaucoma can cause, you know, where, you know, very painful and you have to nucleate the eye many times. You know, this just occurs and it's something that you do see. So that is something that, that was seen in... 12.6% of your exam, so it's a significant issue. It doesn't cause a lot of pain or morbidity or death or anything like that, but something to pay attention to. You don't want to be looking at eyes on your, on your pet dog and, and seeing these white spots on the surface of the eyes. And the mode of inheritance in your breed is undetermined.
and some breeds it has a fairly um, recessive characteristic where it's kind of predictable, uh, but not a simple recessive, but, but very strongly so. Um, but uh, again, not enough of that has been done in enough breeds to, to generalize on corneal dystrophy. Okay, let's talk about one of your um, chick requirements is hypothyroidism in the Afghan hound. So hypothyroidism or low thyroid, so a couple of people put down hyperthyroid on the health survey, um, which was ignored, but hyperthyroidism doesn't really occur in dogs. Um, it occurs in cats. They get hyperthyroid goiters, and hypothyroidism is extremely rare in cats, but it's what occurs in dogs. So it's low-functioning thyroid. Um, it is, the inherited form is autoimmune thyroiditis. It's an, it's an immune-mediated destruction of where, where the dog produces antibodies against its own thyroid gland and destroys the thyroid gland. So it's an autoimmune disease. And dogs with measurable antibodies are affected. So it's the TGAA or thyroglobulin autoantibody is what you're looking at in your thyroid profile. And OFA accepts thyroid profiles from certain places and they don't accept from others. And that's because there's been enough statistical studies to show that the method that is used to do the thyroid profile varies between institutions and laboratories. And certain methodologies are not accurate and other methodologies are highly accurate. And so OFA only accepts those using the most accurate methodologies. And not to get into all the semantics of it, but Dr. Jean Dodds uses her own methodology, okay? I believe her methodology, but she will not submit that methodology for analysis. So therefore, her thyroid profiles are not accepted by OFA. And it's just a simple, you know, if you want it accepted, it needs to be statistically analyzed and, and, and studied, but she likes to keep her methodology to herself. And, and so um, while I believe in what she's doing with her thyroid profiles, unfortunately, they are not recorded because it hasn't been standardized uh, um, against the, the standards. Um, so 7.3% of 494 Afghan hounds tested by Michigan State U University are positive for thyroglobulin autoantibodies. The average for all breeds is 7.5%. So you're right smack in the average across all breeds. Now some breeds are in the you know, high 20% and some breeds are in like 1 or 2%. But you're right there in the middle. Um, for 799 dogs that were tested um, and registered and recorded in the OFA thyroid database, 8.4%. So not a huge difference from the 7.3. So that's about where your percentage is for hypothyroidism in your breed. So let's talk about the disease process. So a thyroid profile is a snapshot of a continuous disease process. Okay, you're getting a thyroid level, a T4 level, which is the important part. You're getting a TSH level, which is a thyroid stimulating hormone level, which is produced by the pituitary based on the level of thyroid hormone in the body. If the thyroid hormone level is low, the pituitary will kick out more thyroid stimulating hormone to say make more thyroid profile. If the thyroid level is normal, the TSH level is going to be normal. Um, and then the thyroglobulin autoantibody is the antibodies against the thyroid gland. So what happens is the body starts producing antibodies, but there's a lot of thyroid tissue present, so nothing really happens. You've got high an antibody levels and normally function thyroid. At one point in time, the thy enough thyroid tissue has been destroyed that the thyroid hormone level, the T4 level, starts to drop, okay? And the pituitary gland says, hey, there's not enough thyroid hormone, let's produce more TSH, and the TSH level goes up. When enough of the thyroid is destroyed, the stimulus for the antibody is the antigen that it's, that it's attacking, which is the thyroid gland. And once that thyroid gland is destroyed and replaced with scar tissue, the stimulus to produce the antibody disappears, and those antibodies go away. And you're left with what's called end-stage hypothyroidism, which is low T4, high TSH, no autoantibody. And that's considered end-stage hypothyroidism. The internists used to say there's two types of hypothyroidism. 
autoimmune thyroiditis and idiopathic hypothyroidism. But what they were doing is that they were looking at dogs, that, and the only differentiation was whether you had thyroglobulin autoantibodies or not. But they're looking at dogs at end-stage hypothyroidism after their antibodies went away. And now they recognize that the vast majority of all hypothyroid dogs are, is autoimmune thyroiditis and not idiopathic, or I don't know what caused it, and, um, and that that is what you're looking at there. So the bottom line is, to make this diagnosis, you need to test when you can monitor and measure the um, autoantibodies. This thing's hitting my chin. Um, and so those antibody levels are present usually between two to six years of age with a peak level at about four years of age. Some severely affected dogs might have high thyroglobin autoantibody levels at one year of age, um, and, and they may be gone by the time they're three or four years of age. So my recommendation, and a recommendation that's used by a lot of people, is to do two thyroid profiles on your dogs, two years apart, between two to six years of age. And if both of those profiles are negative for thyroglobulin autoantibodies, then your dog does not have autoimmune thyroiditis. And again, we're not even talking about tests for carriers. All we're doing is trying to figure out who's affected and who's not affected. And even dogs that are affected, some of them may not show clinical signs of hypothyroidism. They, they may still deal with low thyroid and be normal, and some of them may be lethargic and obese and, and really affected with their hypothyroidism. So a um, couple of things you need to understand about thyroid is that any strong immune stimulus is going to raise the, all antibody levels in the body. So you don't want to do a thyroid profile after a vaccination because all vaccinations are highly simulative of the immune system. And, and those levels are going to be up there for like, you know, to me, I say three to four months. You know, some people will say for a month or so, but I, you know, I've seen them be persistent. So, so I, I want to be, you know, as, you know, as conservative as I can with that recommendation. If you're running a test that's going to make a breeding decision, you kind of want to know that you're, far enough out there that, that we're not worried about that complication. I'm not saying that you can't do a thyroid profile during a vaccine visit because you haven't given the vaccine. Okay, draw your, your profile and, and give the vaccine if the vaccine is due. And I believe in three-year vaccines, um, not one-year vaccines, uh, but for the core vaccines. Um, but that's something you do need to pay attention to because you, you can get a false positive on that. Um, and, this, and the last thing is that we're only talking about autoimmune thyroiditis. There are a lot of thyroid responsive conditions that are out there. I'm not even going to call them diseases, but conditions that are out there. We know you can improve coat with thyroid. We know that uh, some of the reproductive specialists will say that, you know, if a bitch is, is missing, you know, is, is not conceiving, and they run a thyroid pro profile and their, their levels of T4 are below the mid-range, of what we expect for thyroid if they're in the lower half, even if they're in the normal range or in their lower half, they're going to supplement thyroid. And a lot of times that'll allow them to, con to conceive. But those are just thyroid responsive conditions. That's not, you know, you can't then say, well, my dog was hypothyroid because that's not what's going on because the thyroid levels will vary with any kind of disease process or any kind of uh, symptoms. And they, they vary from day to day in every dog. So that's the, that's the disease autoimmune thyroiditis that you have concerns of, and that's one of your chick uh, requirements. Is thyroid is hypothyroidism the worst possible disease you can?